18, I teach into archaeology, <laughs> and uh, there was this guy, and, and there was all these young students, and I'm, I guess I'm a scary old professor now, right? But Brian, you know, we could joke, and it was, yeah. we had a good time, and then uh, he was taking physics and planetary, and uh, uh, I snagged him to work for me for some summers, and then he continued into a master's, uh, probably move into a PhD. He's got a Fulbright Fellowship in the fall for 10 months to go to uh, Germany. <laughs> where you'll see a bigger vibrator truck than we have, right? And yes. uh, uh, what he's going to talk about today, as I said, so it is uh, I like to try and mix the rock physics and the seismic. Uh, and uh, this is uh, a nearby place where we could uh, test our equipment on the impact structure. And so uh, he discovered the size of this crater that nobody knew before. So uh, he's going to show you some of his uh, data from that. So, Brian? Excellent. Thanks, Ed. When, as Doug introduced me, uh, I'm Brian, and I'll be talking to you about the our seismic investigation of the local impact structure here. It's located about 45 miles northwest, 45 minute drive. Um, it's currently an active quarry, but also related to other impact structures throughout the the world here. So, click on it. Sorry. Do I have to click on it? Yeah, just click on it. Okay. I thought I just yes. Down, 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 down. The down, down. Yeah, yeah. No, now it's working. There okay. we go. Okay, so what we want to do is uh, looking at impact structures. The purpose of it is learning their geometry of them. Uh, involve that with seismic properties with what we're interested in Doug's research group of looking at the damage that's done with these underneath them. So they're very catastrophic events that happen. The porosity changes, etc. Because that all ties in with the seismic wave sensitivity. It's very sensitive to that and how it propagates through it, which can kind of lead us into seeing these, I don't know, pretty rare events on Earth uh, where we have the actual analog sites to look at to see how damage porosity densities and things that we can measure in our lab change with these huge events. Um, and then I have a picture from the GRAIL mission. It's harder to see, at least for me with the lighting, but just trying to point out the, the gravity variations of I don't know what my cursor is, where like these giant impact structures happen where you have the gravity lows and gravity highs. So that's what we're kind of looking at here at our impact structures as well. And with that today, we'll be looking at, it's an impact structure. It hasn't been confirmed like an impact crater site yet. Uh, it's completely, it's he very heavily eroded structure in Alberta. We have a data set from that I'll be kind of looking into as well as uh, our Ketlin impact structure crater here in that I'm currently in the process of going through, but as we have some preliminary results we got earlier this week, which is pretty exciting. Um, but to go into that, I wanted to talk briefly about just impact crater morphology. I know we all come different backgrounds, so at least showing what we're doing with impact craters. So the more most basic one, you have a simple impact crater. Uh, it comes in, you have an initial compact compression stage where the impactor coming in 10, 11 kilometers a second for us hits the uh, the impactor hits us, creates this shock wave. Then you have this, it ends of the comp end com contact compression stage where it then moves into an excavation stage. And this excavation stage is, it's very quick. You know, a lot of people seen Behringer crater. Uh, it's like a 1.2 kilometer diameter crater. The excavation stage on that with an impact crater, it took about 11 seconds for it to empty completely out. Like it's very quick. It goes with the diameter of it and there's the gravity on the planet. But at the end of the excavation stage, uh, it's given this thing called the transient cavity. You'll talk, uh, you'll hear me talk about that later involved with the Kentlin structure, but it's the transient crater when you transition to another one is the extent of where the crater, the size of the actual crater that it's making. And that's when you get this modification stage. That's where the rocks start to fail underneath the intense damage and stress they were put under and start to collapse in creating this breccia lens and you have the ejecta window or ejecta blankets that go around. And then finally you're left with the final impact crater where you see the nice rim example being like Behringer crater, then you have the ejectas out and all the damage underneath it. Go in with a complex crater formation, same thing with the impact contact compression stages as before. But now with the excavation stage, it's such a larger impact impactor that's hitting earth what it does is with this shock wave that comes out you actually have a rebound that's kind of happening with material below it 
which then goes into the modification stage where you have this part where the rocks are starting to fail underneath how deep the uh, cavity was and they start to fail. So they slump down and you also have that material coming up with, along with the rebound, which adds to this thing called the central peak that it's creating. And uh, we're, we're left with this final impact crater structure, which you had these normal faults that happen afterwards with those slumping that it hits. Uh, this, the larger the impactor, the greater the diameter to depth ratio becomes. Uh, so these are a lot more shallow compared to the normal impact, simple impact crater. This is the structure we're kind of dealing with. We're dealing with here in Kentland. However, it's very heavily eroded. So if you picture all the glaciation, everything just sliced it probably down through here, cutting off. We don't see the rimming anymore. We, it's being actively mined in the central peak right now by the uh, Rogers group uh, with limestone. And with that, uh, there's just quick little transition diameters between. So anything below this line is for simple craters. Anything above is more complex structures. Um, for earth, you see this large bar. It all depends on the type of rock. Are you hitting crystalline, sedimentary? Uh, what on average, the impactor, or after about a three kilometer diameter size on earth, you're transitioning to that complex crater zone. These are images of a complex structure and a simple crater. This is a simple crater taken by the high rise of Mar on Mars. This is a couple kilometer diameter crater, less than less than five. This one is a Tico crater on the moon. It's a 86 di kilometer diameter crater. So it's it's a lot larger to, to do that, but it's effects with the gravity. And um, I forgot the shatter cone to show, but uh, one thing that we saw at, at Kentland, um, as you see on this, we you have the impactor coming in. And for, for note, when you have this impactor, this was made for about the 10, 11 kilometer impact. Your, your initial site where you get this all this melt, you have about 50 gigapascals of pressure. So kind of equivalent of like 2000 kilometers inside the earth, like pressures. And then it, the shock wave comes out. And over here, you have this zone marked in the red. It's called shock metamorphism. That's where you have, where we saw it was, Kentland Crater was the first one to tie in shatter cones with impact craters. And uh, what that is, is a shatter cone. You have the shock wave propagates of about the five megapascals of pressure it takes. It, it propagates through, it hits an impurity of it, and it makes like a little cone wave through the rocks. And those are very indicative of an impact structure or a nuclear bomb blast. Here's an image from uh, what Doug's group did, uh, him and his former PhD student, Nick, Chris Nixon, when they were in IODP 364 of the Chicxulub crater, so the, the dinosaur killing impact. Uh, where they ran this VSP just to show you the the damage that we're looking at with these uh, impact structures into these into the rocks. Uh, this pinkish part is signifying the granites in the in the uh, core sample they had, and you can see this max P wave speed should be six kilometers a second, but what they're getting is more around the four. Like you're seeing the damage loss with that, as well as uh, you have the S waves, you know, from the three and a half down to like the two in it. So just kind of like highlighting those. Um, those differences on that, their, their seismic stuff. Um, now going into one of the similar structures, uh, we're looking at data. I will be further looking into it more along the Fulbright stuff with mine, but is this a Bow City impact structure? Um, it's located in Alberta. It's looked to be around an eight kilometer diameter crater, kind of centered around this region over here, where um, in 20. 13, I believe they uh, did a seismic survey over it. Uh, Doug's group did with his former master student, uh, Wei Shi, and they ran all these black lines on it are old industrial seismic lines that they ran uh, that were done in the area. The new lines that they ran, there was a, this, I'll refer to this one as line one, this red line right here. And later this blue one is line two going in, but they ran those, those uh, seismic profiles over it to, estimate the craters or image it to see, is it really similar to an impact structure or not? And uh, with that, the, this is seismic tomography of the black line going across it all. Uh, so the old industrial data where you're seeing, you know, this is you know, like 11, 10, 11 kilometers of data right here, but along the side, you then have this kind of faulting zones here 
which again looks like the, the fault normal fault that you have away from the impact or a complex crater as well as this weird uplift zone happening towards their line and you can see it in the in the tomography data where you have a low velocity zone up top but then you have that rebound of a little bit higher more dense material coming up to fill in that void um, so it looks indicative of something that from a hypervelocity impact event but no shock mortis no shock metamorphism has been found there yet so it, it's not a crater officially as of this point. Um, here's some tomography I ran of the of line two. So that blue line going in from the central peak. And it's a lot more shallow compared to what they had. Um, but so you're only seeing about 200 meters of it. But then we do have a, like a little weird low velocity zone here on it. Uh, would like to further, you know, later on it. it in on the Fulbright stuff, like look, relook at the tomography, go through it again, better processing, and just check it out myself based off of the data that she picked on it. And this is one of the goals too with my with our seismic data we're going through with Ken Lynn is to look at this because what way she was able to do is this is now her line one that she ran so that red line at the beginning, where after it was fully processed, you see these seismic, you see these like faulting almost. Like weird events happening and it was interpreted to be these different groups by uh, one of their geologists they had over there helping out with it to identify these bedrock layers and the you can see these little the litric faulting happening so really heavily damaged area then the, the untouched zone below it and then line two you kind of see the the intro into what would be the central peak uh presumed to where you have now those rocks instead of being flat are being brought up in a weird just completely damaged zone and uh, so we're hoping to, our next steps, at least with my data, we're going through to get to this end result on our end. Um, so the, the current study we're using is for, is the Kentland impact crater. It, this is an image taken that Doug took in the middle. We were just in the middle of the, of the crater, the central peak, just showing the, all the damaged rock and it's going up at weird angles and stuff coming back. Um, it's, it's located in Newton County. As I said, um, it's being, currently being active mined. It's a lot of, we're all very flat terrain over here and it was just, everything else is just flat lying paleozoic rocks and until they've started finding in this mining stuff, they found some shatter cones and started noticing some weird activity with the rocks. And um, with that, this, this is an old image, aerial image of the quarry. The right side of the image is north and the left side of the image is south, just to kind of orient. But so this is where they were actively mining it. and. The Kentland structure, this is a little geologic map of, of Indiana. The structure here, you see this little circular area. It has a mix of like these Devonian uh, rocks. It just has a bunch of like a little mix of grad bag stuff. But an interesting thing about the structure, which is what we're, I'll go into a little bit more later, is they don't really know how large it is. The bad grammar on it to where they say it's, there's a disturbed area that reaches 13 kilometers, but they don't define what a disturbed area is or any faulting or um, but we're looking at, and there's the uh, Shakopee Dolomite is the oldest rock exposed to the surface in the quarry. And that sits at about 600, like in the surrounding areas, it's untouched at about 600 meters depth. That's at the surface. So something at least 600 meters got raised up for it. And I'll be going into that with my, my data on this. So it, we ran our seismic profile uh, to kind of touch on this. this, this image right up here. This is the quarry now, so it's oriented north to south. Um, what we did is we started off by placing out these smart solar systems that Doug mentioned that we we have, and it's these ones marked permanent, these large red ones. We put those out at the start of the survey and just didn't move them. They stayed out there for up to 35 days just collecting data. And it's harder to see, but these cyan ones, we laid out these two lines first, and then after we shot our profile and went down. Once we got to a certain point, we were doing a rolling survey. We moved these to then reach further on that to kind of cross cut the profile as we were moving along. Uh, so we just called those, we refer to those as temporary. So that's just giving you those because we were uh, moving those. But with ours, we we used the 6,000 pound uh, Peak Force 5. Our receiver spacing was about four meters. Uh, our shot spacing besides the first initial offset of the profile was a four meter spacing shot interval. We got a very high resolution data on it. Uh, we had our 240 geophone system and walk. We have very good 
accurate GPS timing and elevations of our data. And we were hoping to get right around here with our line. But as you can see, we had some troubles with the vibe. So we only got about 5.3 kilometers there because I wanted to reach a minimum. If, if people say it's 13 kilometers diameter, I'm going to prove or disprove something and, and see if we can see any of that faulting in the seismic data. Um, but we have the smart solo data after it to look at to see um, see if we can see any of the faulting after that. So here's a full profile line of our the tomography of uh, that I ran. It's so this is the left side of the image is north and south as you go. And keep in mind that this image looks it's a drastic drip dip down that looks like that complex impact structure that I was showing you. How it, it it's you'll see in subsequent slides is you're only looking at about 350 meters of, of total stuff. So it's very stretched out and it's these, this dip is going to be more gradual on it because we're looking at a, a lot smaller scale, but we're kind of seeing some really interesting things with this, right? We get these low velocity zones and uh, this we were arguing like could be, is it a weird artifact that we're getting in the data on it? Um, but We'll, we'll discuss in that one later, but then it seems to flatten out a lot and seem to be relatively interesting. And all of these are in, it doesn't print out with a scale bar, but it's, they're all meters per second on this. Here's an example shot gather I just wanted to show. Uh, it was one I liked in the field. We were just testing our data and seeing it. And it, uh, so this is one of the ones we'd work with. Uh, these, we were crossing a road, so we just didn't have any signal on these receivers, but we got a lot of weird just movement down here. And it was nice just seeing these perfect just refraction lines and reflections in the, in the data. It was really, really great to see in the field, but you know, there's really not a whole lot on this, on this image that some sample of our data you'd see me work with. And then, you know, picking first breaks was always a blast, <laughs> but uh, here's, there's this is a huge image. All this, this is the very first step gathered this week. It's an extremely brute stack that we knocked out. It's no migrations done. We just have it CMP brute stack to kind of see something. This is our entire thing to you know three seconds. We have three thousand milliseconds on here, and the x axis is just our CMP. Uh, it's a large one, but one thing to note, my, is around the thousand millisecond mark. It, looks to be that's our like zone for getting into the bedrock in the area then so everything above it is all that uh all those sediments that we're discussing with the movement up and and whatnot but here's a closer zoom in of it for the first thousand milliseconds and we kind of start seeing some this to me was exciting like because we don't know where when we did our profile, we were left of the central peak, but we didn't know, are we going to be hitting part of the central peak as we go out or not? And it was actually pretty flat looking with these lines before and after. But then you start seeing some weird movements as you start approaching closer to that three, three and a half kilometer range. And then you see some potential weird faulting happening, and then it just rounds out. So it's kind of interesting to see that because, you know, again, you'd think we're going to be in the central peak because a lot of papers, I don't know where they got the number from, suggested that the central peak dome was about two kilometers in size. And I was within 1.2 kilometers of it, and I don't see it. Overlaying the tomography over it, it kind of matches up with this weird zone. It seems pretty flat. And then you start dipping down into this lower velocity zone where there's a lot of disruption right here. And then where you, then it kind of rims back up and throw and goes flat over here at the end. So it was really, really nice to see because we're not on this, we're not really seeing any disturbance after that, like this, this low velocity zone, it seems like just go flat, which again, we're, it's going to be a lot cleaned up. This is just initial looks at it, but it's kind of constraining to what we see is about a seven kilometer size diameter crater, which goes with one of the old empirical relations like Jay Malosh and some others have come up with where, like I said before, the dolomite sits about 600 meters depth. And there's the empirical relation of how much uplift happened to the size of the impact structure. And 
with 600 meters depth, it correlates to about a seven kilometer diameter size crater. And we're seeing, you know, about that size here in our, our data with that. And this is just now to look at it, just a larger scale zoomed in more we're about the first 350 milliseconds of the data. Where now, if I put it over, just kind of see a, a, dip, a closer up view of our snapshot of it um, to, to kind of see how it, how it matches up with that. And so it's nice to kind of constrain something to we're not seeing it being 13 kilometers. It's more we're seeing. Yeah. So now uh, for the conclusions of this, the, the Bow City structure is a very low velocity. It has a low velocity zone in the central uplift area, and we saw those rim faults. Uh, it's very indicative of a complex impact structure, but need to find shock metamorphism to kind of claim it as that. So hopefully we'll, that'll be a project for someone in the future over there. For this Kent, Kentland crater, the goals which we're hitting as we're going through now is to delineate these outer faults and boundaries. Hopefully later we'll see if there's anything further with any of the smart solar data. Uh, can do more tomographic inversion for these velocity structures. The future work with that is looking at you know the petrophysics, the porosity, mineralogy of these rocks in in our lab to see more about it. Um, conduct velocity and isotropy on these rock samples in our lab, kind of the further study how the damage goes with it, and also conduct a high high resolution gravity survey through going down our same seismic profile line we ran. Maybe go further to kind of match it up with our data, and then analyze our smart solar data set. It hasn't been worked on yet, so hopefully match that up and, and get more data out of that. But yeah, just had to feed up again. Had any questions? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Questions for Brian? Not yet, no. It was very, 